the, the next section is on energy conversion technologies. We are going to have two Stanford faculty members, Professor Xianghui Fan and Professor Alberto Saleo. Uh, let me uh, get uh, Xianghui onto the, onto the stage. Um, Xianghui is a professor in electrical engineering at Stanford University. And you have seen over the years, Xianghui have this uh, amazing idea using um, radiated cooling to do energy conversion for more than a decade long right now, using the sky you know, for cooling and using the heat exchange between uh, different objects radiation. He has been very, very creative on that front. And this project, I believe, is also funded by our industry uh, partners right here. With that, Xiang Hui, take, take it away. Okay. All right, so uh, I'll be, uh, let me just give a very brief uh, discussion of some of the work that we're doing. Um, uh, my group actually uh, is a group that uh, is interested, generally speaking, in photons. And uh, this is, uh, or in electromagnetic field, and uh, uh, fundamentally, uh, photons are described by Maxwell equations. Uh, and uh, uh, so uh, the, all the ability that we have in controlling photon uh, comes from understanding the basic properties of Maxwell equation. So uh, in the uh, case of energy, uh, controlling electromagnetic wave or controlling photon uh, is really very, very important. Uh, certainly, our primary source of energy uh, come to us, uh, sunlight, uh, through photons. And also, the way we access energy uh, is largely dominated by use of electromagnetic field. One of the uh, observation here, in terms of the detailed form of the technology, what you see here, uh, the technology of harvesting sunlight is certainly very, very different from the technology that you use to plug into electric grid uh, because the frequency of the electromagnetic fields are drastically different. But the underlying physical idea behind all these technology, as I mentioned, come from the same equation. And therefore, advances in thinking about some of the basic electromagnetic properties can have very broad implication for a wide range of energy technologies. So um, as he mentioned, uh, in the uh, past uh, 10 years or so, we really uh, have been pushing for a variety of different applications of uh, uh, advancing electromagnetics for energy applications. Uh, I'll be talking about radiated cooling, but I'd like to also mention uh, some of the other work that we're very interested in. Uh, uh, electromagnetic energy transfer, for example, as well as understanding some of the basic theoretical limit of energy conversion process. In fact, uh, my student, uh, Yubin Park, who is sitting there, uh, will give a poster uh, about some of our work uh, in really try to push uh, the photovoltaic energy conversion to its ultimate theoretical limit. So uh, with that, let me talk a bit about radiated cooling. Um, so the basic argument is to try to harvest the coldness of the universe. And uh, uh, the thermodynamic argument is a relatively straightforward one. Uh, this is a sink, heat sink, with a very low temperature. And the Carnot efficiency limit tells you that it's great to have a heat sink with a temperature that's much lower than the temperature on Earth. So the vast majority of the energy harvesting technology at the moment use the Earth as a heat sink, and being able to use a much colder heat sink can have very broad implication. The uh, photon comes in because we can radiate out. Uh, the atmosphere is transparent around 10 micron, and that happened to be the peak of black body radiation uh, of a 300 Kelvin black body, and that happened to be every one of us. So the point here is that uh, every day, in fact, whenever you see the sky, you radiate the heat out, and therefore that is a cooling mechanism. And now, uh, in spite of what I said about radiated heat out, uh, in order to do that as a cooling technology, you need to do a little bit more. And the point is that typically, if you're in an outdoor environment during the day, the sun is gonna heat it up. And so in general, in spite of the fact that you are a very good radiator, radiator cooler, uh, you don't feel any cooling. 
And so the uh, idea that we proposed about 10 years ago uh, was to develop a material system that strongly reflects sunlight, but radiate very strongly in the 8 to 13 micron window. Uh, the first material that we did is a multi-layer dielectric thin film placed under silver. And when we put it on the roof of our electrical engineering building, we get a temperature that's about five degrees Celsius below ambient with 900 watt per meter squared of sunlight directly hitting the sample. So uh, since then, there are probably uh, hundreds of material systems uh, that people have explored for radiator cooling purposes. And these range from, uh, for example, uh, textiles that I'm going to talk about, uh, to building materials such as concrete, to wood, uh, to very wide range of materials. The reason that you can see this uh, radiated cooling from the wide, these wide range of materials are basically for two reasons. One of them is that many material, in fact, most of the material that you encounter are strongly radiatively emitting around the 10 micron wavelength range. So therefore, they naturally uh, radiate the heat out. So the engineering that requires you to do then uh, is to engineer the solar reflection. And there are a huge variety of ways you can do that to enhance the solar reflection. So here's an example, uh, a, a collaboration with uh, a Professor Jia Zhu in Nanjing University, uh, where uh, we take silk and then uh, engineer it to make it a radiative cooler. Uh, so, uh, as I mentioned, like many materials, silk are, are strongly thermally emissive, uh, but, uh, and also it shines, uh, if you look at it, and therefore it is actually a pretty good solar reflector. It turned out that it's not reflective enough to, you need to reflect sufficient amount of sunlight to get to cooling purposes. So, uh, what uh, uh, Professor Drew did uh, is to uh, attach the silk textile with zinc oxide nanoparticle to enhance the reflection in a UV wavelength range. So uh, in the test, as you see here again on the roof of the Stanford building, uh, you see that with nanoprocessed silk, you can get to a temperature that is below ambient air temperature, again, uh, passively without electricity input. So uh, as I mentioned, uh, really uh, there are uh, almost any material these days, uh, you can probably think about a way to engineer it into a radiator cooler. And so the question is, how do you go about using it? Well, one of the uh, uh, important application of this is for air conditioning of buildings. And uh, in this case, what we do is we couple a radiator cooler uh, with standard air conditioning system. We lower, for example, the water temperature below ambient and use that to drive a water-based cooling tower. And uh, this is uh, slowly uh, but uh, steadily getting deployed uh, in California uh, through a startup that uh, uh, I co-founded with uh, two of my former postdocs. This is now led by uh, uh, Dr. Eli Goldstein. And this is a picture of one of these uh, Skyco systems uh, set up in uh, uh, some of the supermarkets around here. Now, uh, the other uh, technology that we are quite interested, uh, which is more fundamental, uh, is really in trying to uh, harvest energy uh, from the coldness of the universe. And uh, uh, the basic thermodynamic argument uh, is that anytime you have something uh, cold that's below MB, anytime you have a temperature difference, uh, that temperature difference can be harvested. And we have a natural temperature difference between the Earth's temperature and the outer space. And that uh, certainly thermodynamically can be harvested. Uh, moreover, uh, this is essentially the outgoing thermal radiation from Earth, and uh, the incoming solar radiation and the outgoing thermal radiation are roughly balanced in order for the S to be a steady state. And so therefore, the amount of energy that's available is in fact quite substantial. So as an initial step towards it, uh, this was an experiment where we take a nighttime radiator cooler, and then we uh, put a thermal electric generator on the backside to harvest energy from the, uh, to harvest energy from the ambient to the cooler, uh, the temperature difference. And this allows us uh, experimentally, uh, in fact, to generate light uh, from the darkness of the night sky. And uh, um, as I mentioned, uh, almost any material you can make into a radiated cooler. And so one of these material systems that you can do is, in fact, a solar cell. 
uh, the encapsulated solar cell has a silica layer on top, which is a very strong radiated cooler. So at night, uh, it will actually have temperature far below ambient. And based on this effect, uh, we have uh, recently done an experiment where, again, we put a thermal electric generator on the backside of the photovoltaic and to show that uh, you could actually get uh, electricity out at night from a solar panel uh, using uh, this kind of technique. The experimentally observed power density uh, that we see here uh, at night uh, in this particular experiment is about 50 milliwatt per meter square, uh, which is a very modest amount of electricity. It's enough to drive a light emitting diode, uh, but it's not that much amount of power. But for these things, it's important to understand what the fundamental thermodynamic limit would be. And so, uh, as it turned out, for every technology associated with harvesting sunlight, there's a symmetry that map into a technology that harvests the coldness of the universe. And therefore, for every theoretical limit for solar energy conversion, you can compute a corresponding power density limit for harvesting the energy from the universe. And the theoretical number actually is quite substantial. These are electricity number. They range from on the order of 50 watt per meter square all the way to about 150 watt per meter square, depending on the detail scheme that you consider. The point here is that our experimental number is about uh, quite a few order magnitude below this. And to me, this is a very interesting opportunity that point to substantial room uh, for further fundamental research in this area. So uh, with that, uh, let me just uh, put out my summary slide. Just want to give an example that uh, advancing fundamental understanding of electromagnetics uh, really has a lot of interesting and important implication in energy technology. And let me stop here. I think Xiang Hui, wait for a second, Xiang Hui. Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> we'll have panel discussion. However, I figure, um, you know, after Alberto's talk, you might forget about your question already. So why don't I take uh, maybe oh, okay. a question for now, Xiang Hui? Sorry okay. about that. Uh, yeah, is there any questions right. from the audience? We can, uh, Xiang Hui can answer right away. If you don't have a question, we can also wait until the panel. How's right. that, Xiang Hui? Thank yeah. you. <laughs> Uh, let me uh, invite uh, Professor Alberto Silel to the stage. He's a professor in material science engineering. He's the chair of um, the department. He's literally my boss right here. Um, well, Alberto will tell you about what happened in the polymer world. Take it away, Alberto. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, thank you for the introduction and thanks for the invitation. Um, so, what we work in my group is uh, materials and, in particular, uh, class of materials uh, that are called conjugated polymers. So you know polymers uh, from plastics, sort of the, the water container bottle. Um, these are polymers that have uh, more functionality than just um, the structural functionality that you know commodity polymers for. And I will show you how uh, these have multiple uses in energy conversion technologies. So just very quickly, um, the reason why we like these materials is we think of them almost as Lego building blocks. And the, Polymers we work with, you can imagine them as having a backbone, so there's a main chain, and then there's things sticking from them. And the exciting opportunity for us is that you can sort of mix and match the different functionalities to build almost anything you want. So for example, if you have the backbone, I have two backbones drawn there. Uh, one of them is designed to conduct electrons, the other one is designed to conduct holes. They have different energy levels. Um, you can also see they have some um, carbonyls and um, nitrogen atoms, so you can also imagine having something that starts looking like um, a catalyst uh, site, for example. And like I said, you can mix and match them. You can take a certain number of one type, another, a certain number of the other one, and put them all together, essentially making a synthetic designer material that doesn't exist in nature, that you, chemists are really good at making essentially anything you want there. Um, and then at the same time, if you want to process these materials, you have to be able to solubilize them in a solvent. And that's where you use the side chains. Uh, so those are things that will stick to the side. They will grab to solvent. 
that's sort of the zeroth order functionality. You can add more functionality to the side chains. For example, you can make a side chain hydrophilic so that if you have a liquid electrolyte, the liquid electrolyte will like to get in there. Or you can make them hydrophobic if you want it to actually absorb oil, for example. And again, you can mix, mix and match any of these together. So you can have a mix of any percentage of hydrophilic and hydrophobic, essentially designing anything you want with this material and tuning the properties very, very uh, accurately. So here are some examples of energy conversion technologies that we've been working on with polymers. So we've been working on, uh, Shen Hui talked a little bit about this, converting photons to electrons. So this would be a solar cell. Mm -hmm. And solar cells made with polymers have some advantages that are unique compared to conventional solar cells. Lately, we've been interested in sort of a different space, a space, for example, where we convert chemical energy to electrical energy or store chemical energy and electrical energy. This is what you would call a battery. And then the opposite of that would be using uh, electricity to make chemicals, and this is what uh, the function of an electrocatalyst would be. So as you can see, a very different variety of functions essentially perform with this one family of very versatile materials. So starting with um, solar cells, so to make a solar cell with polymers, you actually need two different types of polymers, one that conducts electrons, the other one that conducts holes, so that when a photon strikes a solar cell, the electrons will go one way, the photons will go the other way, and this generates electricity and a potential difference, and the product of current times potential difference is uh, energy. So here's an example of uh, a pair of materials that's been looked at recently. In our group, we looked at the two. Um, actually, this pair of materials can reach power conversion efficiencies all the way up to 18%. So now we're talking about numbers that start becoming interesting. Uh, the current record for organics is around 20%, and it keeps creeping up. And, and the reason why these materials are interested, interesting here is that you can design them to essentially match the absorption of the solar spectrum. Remember, you can design them any way you want, so you can uh, figure out their energetics so that they exactly match where the solar spectrum is at its highest intensity, and also uh, make the energetic level so that the electrons and the holes are comfortable and can be extracted with high efficiency from the cell. So that's where the backbone design comes into play. The side chains is where sort of the polymers look at each other, and so that controls how soluble they are into each other. And the reason why you want to control that is because, you remember, you have one material that conducts electrons, the other that conducts holes, so you want, to, you want them to be phase separated, but at a right length scale, so that the charges can get out efficiently. So you see how this, the advantage of the design of being able to design the backbone and the side chain separately, and being able to do it with high accuracy and precision, uh, really comes into play in this type of application. And, and what's unique about organic solar cells or solar cells made with these materials, they're made with earth abundant elements. The embodied energy is quite low. They can be processed from solvents at low temperature and they can be made different colors because you can design the backbone to have different colors so you can make building integrated photovoltaics. You can even make solar cells that are transparent, which seems to be a misnomer. If it's transparent, how can it absorb? Well, it absorbs the infrared and the UV and it's transparent in the visible window, and there's a company, local company called Ubiquitous Energy that's uh, commercializing these transparent solar cells. You can also optimize the solar cells so that uh, it works in tandem with a greenhouse so that the colors that are best uh, absorbed by plants go through, and the colors that plants don't really need get absorbed by the solar cell and essentially make a greenhouse that produces its own energy to run. And there are several companies are exploring uh, this type of application. So as you can see, it's a sort of a different space in conventional solar cells with, with some uh, interesting applications nonetheless. Now the applications we've been thinking about more recently involve electrochemistry. So there you have to be a little bit more clever with the side chains. So remember the backbone conducts electrons. And now if you want to do electrochemistry, you need to be able to bring ions into play. And that's what you do with the side chains. So you make the side chains such that they like water, they're hydrophilic, and if and the water contains an electrolyte, salty water, then you can have, for example, chloride ions, or uh, if you have a different type of polymer, you can have sodium ions go in. And so now you have the opportunity of combining electricity and chemistry and do electrochemistry with these materials. So if you have a material that likes holes and a material that, li that likes electrons, their Fermi level, or the energy of the electrons and the holes, are different in these two materials. And so in this case, you have um, 
One of the materials, what we call the p-type material, will have holes in it. The n-type material will have electrons in it. And if you have a potential difference between the two, and you connect the potential, the two electrodes to a load, uh, you can uh, produce electricity. So you have essentially made, depending on who you talk to, either a battery or a supercapacitor. And this is made with materials that can be uh, completely um, recycled because it's just a single polymer. If you try to do that conventionally, you'll have to have one material that does the ion conduction, one material that does the electron conduction, and if you want to recycle it, you'll have to separate them, and that becomes a little bit more complicated. So we've played around a little bit with this type of system, and we've shown that, in fact, you can um, make an electrode, you can um, dissolve it in a solvent, and then refabricate a new electrode with the exact solution that you made the first electrode with. So this is uh, really an example of uh, very nicely taking advantage of properties of polymers that can be easily dissolved and redeposited. And if you look at where this uh, device sits in the Ragoni plot, it's actually an inter interesting space between um, electrochemical capacitors and your lead acid batteries. So the interesting space here is that you can charge and discharge very quickly these type of supercapacitors of batteries, depending on how you want to call them. Um, their um, power, sorry, their energy density is maybe not as high, but that's something that can be maybe further optimized through materials design. And like I said, the opposite process of that is taking electricity to chemicals. Um, so the idea there is always the same. So you take a polymer, you deposit it on an electrode. Um, in this case, the polymer is designed to have maybe some catalytic sites. And then uh, you design it so that if you want to do electrocatalysis, it conducts electrons. It also has to have the reagents come near it. So it has to be sort of, the, the reagents have to be able to dissolve in it. And the products have to be able to leave as well. But remember, you can design backbone and side chain separately, and so you can start entering a design where all these things can happen in one place, right? The three uh, species that have to be there, the electron, the reagent, and uh, the product can all be there at the same time, and this is an ideal condition to make uh, an efficient catalyst. Um, again, the advantage compared to how you would do electrocatalysis conventionally is there you have to bring these three things together with different materials. So if you want to recycle it, you'll have to separate them. Well, here everything is done very simply in a single material that performs these three functions because we built it with these Lego building blocks that allowed us to you have these three functions in one place. Uh, so the example that we worked it with uh, will choose group is to reduce oxygen to hydrogen peroxide. Um, hydrogen peroxide is an interesting chemical for several reasons. Um, uh, it's used in multiple industries. It's actually um, dangerous to transport, so maybe you want to produce it locally. So being able to produce it locally by electrocatalysis is quite an attractive proposition. And you see there with our polymer, we're able to, um, you have the current density there. This essentially is a proxy for the production of the hydrogen peroxide. And uh, it doesn't have any noble metals. I'm showing there the platinum catalyst because the platinum catalyst, well, it looks like it performs a lot better. It does but it's performing a different reaction. That one is reducing oxygen to water. So our catalyst actually stops at hydrogen peroxide, so it's also chemically selective. It produces the chemical that we wanted to produce. And now remember, you can design polymers to do different things, and so it turns out there is another polymer that can go all the way to uh, water as well. So this polymer is called BBL, and you can see that within a certain potential window, the current is half uh, you, you see it between uh, 0.25 and 0.75 is half than what it is between negative 0.25 and 0.25. And that's half because there it's doing a two electron reaction, so that's a hydrogen peroxide. At higher potentials, it's doing a four electron reaction, so it's going all the way to water. So this, this is a nice way to show how the materials design can really give you selectivity and allow you to reach uh, different products depending on how you operate the material, which is quite unique. And this is really a brand new area of application for these materials. So in summary, the reason why we like to work in the space is that uh, we like the idea that these materials can be designed and synthesized uh, for different type of energy conversion applications, it's all done with earth abundant elements. Maybe later we can talk about the type of synthesis reactions. We heard later you have to really think uh, sort of holistically about these materials, not just about the material itself, but also how you make it. Uh, there is a very vast design space that's uh, barely explored of how to combine all these different functionalities and also how 
the material structure plays into its properties. There is so many aspects at different length scales uh, that give a very uh, rich fundamental research exploration there. Uh, there's a great opportunity to be able to recycle these materials very simply. You just redissolve them and then you redeposit them. When, they've end, when they reach their end of life, because maybe they've degraded, you redissolve them. The part that hasn't degraded, you can reuse it. The part that has degraded, I guess, becomes a waste. And then lastly, because they can be deposited from liquids, you have some unique form factors and applications, which is what I showed in the case of the solar cells, but that's true for a lot of other applications. These materials are also used for LEDs for solid state illumination, for example. So with this, I'll be happy to take any question. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Alberto. Um, any questions for Alberto? There's one over there, and then another one here. Thank you, Professor. Very interesting presentation. I was uh, intrigued by your work on uh, oxygen reduction to form hydrogen peroxide. I believe it's one of the most important uh, things one can do to valorize the oxygen from green hydrogen production. So could you uh, give more detail at what TRL label uh, your current process is? Sorry, what? The oxygen to hydrogen peroxide, uh, technology readiness level, like is it at a research scale or you have a prototype uh, 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 built to convert oxygen to hydrogen peroxide? As in? It, it's still at a research okay. scale. We were funded to really understand whether there is a truly uh, electrocatalytic reaction happening there or not. And the conclusion is that for that particular polymer, there isn't. But the other one that I showed actually does. And so now we're at the stage of trying to understand what uh, feature of the molecular structure gives rise to proper electrocatalytic action of the material. Thank you very much. So in regards to the customizable, customizability of these polymers that you mentioned, does that usually come with a penalty in scaling or is it relatively easy to scale these very customized processes? Well, so the, the current chemistry that is used to synthesize them is not scalable, it's sort of a re research um, type um, chemistry. So um, it, it uses pretty nasty chemicals and uh, um, some reaction conditions that you wouldn't want to scale. But there are well-known alternative syntheses that are scalable. So right now, I have a postdoc who's looking into picking one material sort of as an example. Can we design um, the scalable type synthesis that is also greener that would allow us to make this at scale? So I think the short answer is the way we make them currently for research purposes as we try to hone into the ideal structure, not scalable, but this is a type of thing that a chemical industry is very good at doing, uh, the scaling up with scalable reactions. One in the back. After that one, I'd like to invite uh, also Xiang Hui to the stage for a short panel discussion. Thank you, Professor Salil, for your talk. Uh, so I have a question about the recycling uh, of polymers. So like, uh, so the recycling of polymers, do you mean like recycling the entire long chain polymer molecule or you actually break them down into monomers? No, it's, it's really, so what happens is, let's say the, um, the um, supercapacitor, you cycle it for a number of times and after a while its performance drops a little bit because it degrades and that's a separate question, why it degrades and that's interesting per se. There's probably some um, molecules that react with side reactions and degrade. So then you take that electrode and you dissolve it as is. So the part of the polymer that's non-degraded you can reuse and the part that's degraded you would filter out. So it's not breaking it up and it's not upcycling is really, I would say maybe recycling is not the right word, reusing is maybe a better word. Okay, uh, let me uh, invite also Xiang Hui to stage. Alberto, do you want to sit over here and Xiang Hui over there? Let's have a short panel discussion. Um, I want to ask a few questions. Do I say? Do I say? Um, and I also want to invite audience to ask more questions. Let me start uh, with uh, a couple of questions first. Uh, both of you really presenting several applications. Alberto, for example, you mentioned it could be polymer for solar cells, batteries, electrocatalysis. 
Shanghai, you have radiated cooling. You have also general electricity as well. Uh, for each one of you, uh, what's the most promising application in your field? What's the robot block still ahead of you? Uh, Xianghe, do you want to take it first? Okay, yeah, so um, in the case of radiated cooling, uh, I think it's a general technology that allow you uh, to manage the uh, thermal footprint of object. So uh, you could envision this certainly being quite important in building, and that's one of the things we pursue. Uh, it may be automobile, and in many other situations where cooling is needed. Uh, in terms of roadblocks, uh, I think um, uh, in the case of uh, building cooling, uh, it is a substantial uh, change from the existing technology uh, in doing building cooling. And uh, that takes, uh, that kind of adoption actually does take substantial amount of time. Um, I will also mention that on the technological side, um, the availability of these material and systems and to, uh, is not necessarily an issue and the ability to produce them at sufficient scale but rather is to come up with the right system application and demonstration. Uh, for example, in the case of cooling, uh, I think one of the uh, important thing uh, is that the tunability of the system uh, is going to be very important to be able to adapt to different uh, weather conditions and things like that. How, how is the cost at this moment? Is the cost a big consideration? For example, the rooftop cooling mm -hmm. cost and retrofit, right? Will people right. willing to do retrofit, you know, return on investment and so on? Right, so we did quite a bit of analysis in the very beginning, and that was part of the reason the company got funded, uh, was the fact that, in fact, the material cost uh, in the overall cooling system is almost negligible. Uh, this is probably, in a way, not too different. In fact, the, uh, uh, the value proposition, in many ways, uh, parallel the solar kind of argument that uh, the, uh, the uh, installation cost, the maintenance cost, and the system level cost uh, dominate over the uh, material side of the cost. Yeah. So Alberto, what about for you? Yeah, of the, of the different applications I showed, some of are, are a little bit more mature, some less. So you know, solar cells are more mature, but maybe they're a little bit more of a niche. The one that I think has a lot of potential is the electrocatalysis because of the generality what you can do there. I showed one reaction, but in principle, if once you understand um, what molecular feature generates a catalytic site, uh, you could generalize that to the synthesis of many different chemicals, but also different types of applications. You could imagine that uh, being part of a, of a fuel cell, for example, as an electrolyte fuel cell. And that helps you reduce the cost by removing the need uh, for noble metals. Um, so. I think it, it has a lot of potential, partially because it's completely unexplored. There's very few people looking at that space. And for me as a scientist, it's exciting because there are a lot of great scientific questions that haven't been even addressed yet. Yeah, I remember reading your uh, idea first time about using the polymer, polymer backbone and so on, side chain for electrocatalysis. I thought that's quite creative. And uh, now I'm so glad to see you now reduce oxygen to produce hydrogen peroxide. It's uh, looking pretty interesting. Um, let me ask you a second question that will open to the audience. Uh, and Arun's presentation, uh, he emphasized how do we go to scale? For energy, we do need scale. We talk about you know gigaton level CO2 removal. We, you know, he talked about 100 terawatt hour of storage. Uh, and each application is probably a scaling unit right there. It probably you need to in your mind. Uh, Xianghui, I look at your radiated cooling, I was thinking about well, what's the square footage of the rooftop we can have, well, how many, <laughs> what's the uh, gigawatt or terawatt of uh, radiation can go out of sky to do cooling. So in terms of scaling, do you want to share your thought, uh, whether it's uh, Xianghui in your case, is the radiated power, could you go to the scale, 
or the energy conversion utilizing the universe, the coordinates of universe for that. And Alberto, for you is this polymer material for the three applications you, you talk about. Uh, is there any thought on scaling you could share? Okay. Maybe you can go okay. first. Yeah, so um, um, uh, in fact, Arum talked about uh, radiated forcing of uh, uh, carbon dioxide and methane. And the unit that he's quoting, I think, is order of watt per meter square. Uh, scale of radiative forcing, meaning the uh, radiative uh, imbalance created by this material. The cooling power of um, uh, these uh, radiated cooling material uh, can uh, get to about 100 watt per meter square. So it's actually a very substantial radiative forcing. So uh, in other words, if you uh, adopt this at a uh, substantial scale, uh, you will influence the uh, the radiated balance, uh, both at the local level uh, and uh, at a global level. Uh, one of the uh, very interesting thing that we are starting to look at uh, at the modeling scale uh, is, for example, to what extent uh, can these things be potentially uh, interesting uh, in uh, uh, mitigating urban heat island? Uh, if you adopt it at, uh, at uh, a substantial scale. And I think this is an area that, um, so in that spirit, um, radiated cooling uh, is, uh, if you do it at that scale, is like a geoengineering scale. Uh, but the interesting part of it uh, is that it's a technology that would be used for other reasons, not for geoengineering, but has geoengineering implication. And I think that kind of implication uh, is actually very interesting to be studied. Yeah. Yeah, so when we think of um, scaling, um, we mostly think of how to scale, well, not how to, but whether these specialty polymers could be scaled up to the level, um, to the volumes that you would need to make a dent. Uh, as I said earlier, right now we make them in the lab with you know, chemistry that if I asked my postdoc to make more than a gram, he would just straight out refuse. It's just too dangerous and toxic. But that's one type of chemistry, and there's well-known chemistry that allow the scale up, um, and we're looking a little bit into that. So um, the fact that we use earth abundant elements, some of these polymers come probably as byproduct from the oil industry, so there's gonna be plenty of them available, and uh, people can develop chemistries that are green and scalable. Um, I, not being an expert in that area, but I haven't seen sort of people saying this is a fundamental roadblock. Really the roadblock is to, uh, to zero in the one polymer that you really want to make at scale and refine the chemistry for that one. And, and right now, that's maybe what's stopping us more is if, if you were to say what polymer do you want to make you know, in, in thousands of tons, which one would you pick? We, we don't know. Once we figure out which one that is, um, I think there is no fundamental roadblock to scaling it up. Yeah, I guess for uh, plastics, for polymer, the, the scaling question is quite different. Um, over the years at Prico Institute right here, we have industry partners. I think I've been listening to our partners about you know, scaling. Now with the new school's accelerator, scaling is embedded in our mind. Uh, even though Stanford will continue to do excellent research from discovery type of research, this will, will keep, 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 keep going. And by the same time, I think yesterday for some one of the workshops I mentioned this style of research is we think about all the way to the end first and back it out and see what technology needed, what science we need to you know, develop. That's another way to do research. Uh, Stanford is probably one of the ideal places to get both type of style mingle in to have uh, you know, uh, the best outcome, the best impact. Uh, with that comment, let me open this up to, uh, to the audience for you to ask our panelists questions. Hi, this is, I'm Don Wood, and um, I've got a question for Professor Fan. Um, you talk about SkyCool, the company that you've created. I was a little confused <clears throat> because you've talked, you talked about integrating it with photovoltaics, the radiative cooling for the atmosphere. I was wondering, also, is there cooling for the building? In other words, who, who's going to benefit from that product? Who, yeah. who, who would pay for it? And then where do the collection of benefits go? 
So um, uh, the SkyCool uh, is a company that's for uh, building uh, cooling. Uh, so it's not for photovoltaic, uh, not for energy harvesting, none of those. It's focused on building cooling. Uh, there, the uh, value proposition uh, is that uh, by lowering the uh, temperature of cooling water that used to drive a water-based cooling tower, you can improve the overall system efficiency and get to electricity saving. So then you can do the calculation on how much saving versus how much cost, and that's a value proposition. Um, uh, to me, I think that is uh, uh, probably uh, one of the area where uh, it's uh, likely to see initial adoption of the radiated cooling technology. Uh, there are many other uses of it, for example, the energy harvesting that I talked about, uh, and uh, I think those are at a much earlier stage uh, compared with building air conditioning. Other questions? A question for Professor Saleo. Um, so you were talking about this polymer supercapacitors or batteries, and you showed this plot that they have much lower power density or energy density than lithium ion. So you suggested in your talk that maybe material design would help push this to the higher side. Can you talk more about what type of material design do you envision, uh, whether this is on the cathode, the anode side, the electrolyte? Um, do we change these polymers? And uh, you know, how does that change the physics and the benefits from this technology? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, great question. So. From our perspective, you would start by changing the design of the polymer. That's sort of what we like about these materials. So what is limiting the energy density here is, for example, the number of charges per unit monomer. And, and that's a stability question. So you can design the monomer to accept two or four charges by looking at the design of the conjugated units you have in there. The other big limitation is I showed you you have the side chains that are needed to process these materials. Well, these end up being dead weight once you make your electrode because they don't have any electronic functionality. So um, you can either think of polymers that are what people call microporous. So without those side chains, you can deposit them and the electrolyte can penetrate them. That's the case of that BBL type polymer. It doesn't have any side chains. Um, another thing you can think about that I think is, is more clever is you design the polymer with the side chains and then with a simple reaction, the side chains get cleaved off and leave and so you're left with something that will have a higher energy density. So this is something that people have started looking at. There's other families of materials that are not quite conjugated polymers, but are similar, that are just coming out, that are conjugated uh, networks. Uh, there's a group at MIT that's looking at that. So I think there's quite a bit of latitude there to increase the energy density while keeping the important aspect there is you can keep the peak power high because of this rapid insertion and um, an ejection of ions. So you might be able to sort of move to the right in that Ragone plot and be where, for example, lead acid is, but we did have the advantage of having high power uh, uh, delivery. Uh, but I guess, um, you know, the analog of uh, but different version is actually small molecules, organic molecule redox. There are quite a large number of library, you, you could probably tap in, right, link together with mm -hmm. the side chain wheel polymer that Absolutely. give you the high potential for cathode, low potential for anode. There's probably very wide space uh, for you to explore. Absolutely, yeah. 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 Question here. I'm curious why you chose uh, hydrogen peroxide as an example to, to show here and to research. Uh, is there a particular reason why polymers may be better suited for that? Well, the uh, uh, honest reason is that these polymers degrade in oxygen, <laughs> and so we figured that they were reactive in oxygen, and so this was a good way to, um, to look at uh, a, a sort of uh, turning uh, lemons into lemonade. Uh, this is not to say that they, our electrocatalyst actually does degrade, but I would say they reacted with oxygen. I shouldn't say degrade. Uh, it was well known that every time you use these polymers um, in electrochemical applications, you'd always see these side reactions with oxygen. And so that's sort of where this idea came about. Hi, thank you both for your really inspiring presentations. For Professor Fan, I was really struck by the kind of poetry of using the universe as a heat sink. How do you reach it if it's foggy? Or I, I, I don't really understand how you do that when we have an atmosphere in between us and the universe. 
Uh, right, so uh, like um, almost any ambient energy harvesting scheme of one kind or the other, uh, it depends on the condition of the ambient. So in this case, uh, the, uh, it depends uh, in addition, certainly at a cloudy day, uh, the, uh, the effect largely disappear. Uh, in addition, the water content of the atmosphere uh, is uh, very important. So uh, typically this uh, favors uh, dry and clear sky. So that I think uh, is uh, unambiguous. Now, um, for humid air, there has been quite a bit of work coming out of Asia uh, showing that in summertime, even in, uh, there are a lot of work in China showing that at summertime in China, uh, you can still see substantial cooling effects. So the, uh, it's degraded from what we see here in California, but you can see it. Uh, and in fact, um, there has been a work, and I can dig up with you, where show you a map of uh, where uh, the cooling power density that you can get uh, as a function of locations, and these kind of data actually is available. Uh, they are a large enough area in the world near population center uh, to make uh, the radiated cooling to make sense. Steve. Yeah, uh, I have a question for both of you. Um, in, for both of you, you're using highly designed systems in a controlled environment, and I'm curious how they behave when you're out in the real world. So whether it's you know, exposed to uh, pollen and dust and rain and so forth you know, for the gradient cooling or for the um, electrocatalysis, whether you're, you see impurities and other sub, you know, uh, low concentration things and builds up to side products, how do they behave out in the wild? Can I uh, take it first? So uh, for radiator cooling panel, uh, on the commercial side, in fact, one of the uh, question, and which is uh, related to the adoption, uh, is the fact that how long these panels are going to last. So the typical data that uh, many of the, uh, we are trying to insert into air conditioning systems, and so therefore, uh, there are channels, and uh, uh, the data that they would like to see uh, is essentially the performance of radiated cooling panel over a period of maybe half a year to a year. And that's the kind of data that's being generated. Uh, I will mention that these are largely passive structures. So the degradation can actually be, uh, I would say the degradation issue is in fact uh, uh, less severe compared with, uh, for example, solar cells. Um, the dust uh, also doesn't affect it very strongly uh, because in our case, we're trying to scatter away the sunlight and the uh, thermal radiation part is not very strongly influenced by the dust. But uh, in spite of what I said, which I think fundamentally uh, I think is correct, obviously uh, one would need to test this out over a very extensive period for these kind of things. Xianghui, sure, let me follow up on this yeah. and then we'll go to Alberto. Actually, one, oh, I, one thing have you look at is actually UV yes. coupling with the weather condition. Oftentimes, outdoor is a UV is a right. so, so, so serious. Right, so uh, the, uh, in the sky course panel is a polymer-based panel. Yeah. Uh, there has been, uh, in that case, we did uh, uh, work with 3M uh, to uh, have the right kind of coating so that the UV won't degrade it. So it is an issue uh, in that way. Uh, but they are also inorganic uh, based radiated cooling setup, uh, for example, based on silica and so on, uh, where the UV is far less of an issue. Thank you. Yeah, for us, the uh, electrochemical polymers, there's too new to really know how they would behave um, in real environment. The uh, application, there is quite a bit of data is solar cells. Um, People always thought organic solar cells would degrade quickly. It turns out that if they're well encapsulated, they last for however long you need them to last with maintaining their efficiency. So then it becomes more an issue of, of cost. Is the encapsulation cost effective? But there is no fundamental degradation issue that is uh, different from that of all the other solar cells. Um, thank you uh, for a very interesting presentation. Um, Dr. Fan, this, this is a question for you around the, um, uh, I, I love the poetry that somebody said of uh, getting light from the darkness. 
Um, so that technology seems to me uh, super uh, interesting because it can be you know, employed at scale, especially if you can somehow combine it with existing solar panels. It's obviously huge. What, what's, what are the biggest um, problems of actually implementing that at scale, to, to Rune's point earlier on? Like, what, what, what is the, is it technical? Is it money? What, what, what is it? Um, so, um, at the moment, uh, the demonstrated power density uh, is relatively low. Uh, as I mentioned, we get to somewhere on the order of 50 watt per milliwatt milli per meter square. Uh, we think that with reasonable improvement, both on the panel and on the thermal uh, setup, one can push it probably towards about a watt per meter square scale. And that's something that we're actually pushing hard on in my lab. Um, beyond, as I mentioned, there's still a very substantial gap beyond that number to the theoretical limit. And that requires completely different technology. At the moment, we're using thermoelectric, for example, which the theoretical efficiency is quite low. Um, so uh, at the level of about uh, a watt per meter square, uh, this is, in fact, a power density that's very high for ambient power energy harvesting. Uh, if you take out sunlight, there's no way that you can compare this to solar. But uh, there are many situations where you care about getting energy from ambient. Uh, for example, in uh, powering remote sensing, remote sensors, uh, in off-grid lighting, and in off-grid cell phone charging, and many of these small scale application where I think this kind of technology pushing towards maybe on the order of a watt per meter square kind of power density uh, would make it uh, actually quite attractive. Uh, Alberto and Xianghui, let me uh, ask you uh, uh, maybe about two, two questions um, and then end this uh, panel discussion. The first question is related to the how do we work together with our industry partners? Over the years, if we look at your trajectory, you are doing very fundamental science research. At Xianghui, you are certainly, you move from a theories, become a theory experimental combination. <laughs> I was very impressed that that migration was so successful. Um, and over the years, you also work with industry you know, during the time of Global Climate Energy Project, GSAP, involving SCA, now the whole Prequel Institute. Anything in your wish list you want to speak to our industry partners right here, uh, how to be even more effective to engage with industry? Any other thoughts other than more money investing? <laughs> <laughs> Any uh, more thoughts? I'll, I'll, I'll start. I, uh, uh, first of all, I'm certainly extremely grateful uh, for GSAP uh, and also for the uh, SEA program for supporting my project. Um, I didn't do any energy work uh, before I came to Stanford, and GSAP gave me my first grant to uh, work on energy. So, um, and I, um, uh, in many ways, I think that the, uh, the fact that uh, the industry uh, can support uh, long-term energy research that address fundamental issues in the technology uh, is extremely valuable. And uh, uh, more than the fact of about more money, which of course helps, uh, is the fact that uh, many of these money go to foundational work that uh, later on can point to new opportunities. And that, I think, is a, a very uh, important way that we can uh, engage with industry uh, by looking at longer-term issues. Alberto? Uh, well, actually, similarly to Shanhui, I'm, I'm very grateful for the support. And also, I started doing energy research here thanks to GSEP. One of my first grants was also a GSEP grant. I also want to add that we're an experimentalist group, but I hired a theorist in the group. So <laughs> I'm doing the opposite <laughs> path as Shanhui. Um, and our project on electrocatalysis is supported by SCA, so it's supported by industry. I would say that for me, what the interactions that have been most fruitful is when um, someone wants to talk to me and, and sort of um, explain what the expertise of our group is, is then really figuring out 
what um, um, I don't, I don't want to say problem, but what, what um, idea that industry has that our expertise can be useful for uh, has been uh, the most, uh, the, the best type of interaction. We've, we've developed a very fundamental set of tools to characterize materials and figure out what they do and, and how they work, and it's quite general. So right now we're working on electrocatalysis, but as you've seen, we have quite a broad portfolio of applications because general uh, material science really can be applied in different areas. And so figuring out how to slot into a, um, uh, a question that an industrial partner has, thanks to our expertise, has been a very fruitful way of interacting for me. Yeah, this question is actually for our industry partners right here. We is now new school starting uh, sustainability accelerator together with Prequel Institute and now SEA, our industry affiliate, we are also launching, uh, try to launch a net zero alliance. You know, it's also a process. We want to have a dialogue with our, our industries. How do we work together, deepen the relationship even more, and harvest the opportunity to help the uh, clean energy transition in a very secure way. Uh, my one last question. Um, any completely new ideas from your lab? on energy conversion. You know, today, two of you adding together really cover a big map of energy conversion uh, mechanisms. Any completely new one uh, you are thinking about, maybe already working on, or is within your wish list, you say, well, you know, it's uh, very exciting to go towards that direction. No, no pressure. <laughs> I didn't plan, plan this question. <laughs> Uh, you, so you don't know about this. This is testing your uh, <laughs> immediate response. Um, well, uh, let's see. Um, I would say there are always things I dream about. Um, uh, one of the things that I uh, dream about uh, is uh, active cooling rather than passive cooling with light. Uh, and that's an area that um, in fact, has uh, quite a bit of uh, theory and very few experiments. Uh, but uh, if you look at the potential... You mean you shine the light onto it instead of heating it up, you actually make, make it cooler? Uh, for example, and that's one possibility. Of course, there are laser cooling for it, and there are, I can tell you all the limitations associated with it. Uh, the other thing that's related is something called electroluminescent cooling, uh, which is to... Uh, through emitting light to cool down a body actively. And uh, those kind of things, I think, are uh, very interesting uh, from a uh, technological point of view, uh, both in terms of its potential and in terms of the challenge. So uh, I think there's a lot of things that can be done uh, in thinking about the thermodynamic properties of light and a lot of opportunities that one can think about. Very exciting. For us, the, uh, the, the, some of the ideas I showed are, are so new to our group that what ex, what's exciting is really to explore them more deeply. I showed some really initial results, and I'm really looking forward to explore both the storage and catalysis more deeply with new materials. So no completely new idea. We've generated these recently enough that we want to stick with them for a while. So with this, I encourage all our industry members to uh, talk to Xiang Hui and Alberto to find out more. Thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation.